Okay. So we should be live now. Just going to make sure all my scenes are set up live now. And I'm not listening to us. There we go. Okay. So, what's going on, everyone? We are going to be doing something a bit different for today's stream than we normally would. Uh, I am joined by Sleverd from the Thrawn's Revenge team. Hello, guys. And we are going to be talking about some 3D modeling today. So, uh, we might be going over some stuff that some of you already know at first, but I just want to make sure that everyone's kind of on the same page before we get into uh, actually making the model. I just want to show some of the programs and some of the different steps and also how you actually get a texture onto a model. So uh, first off, I guess we're going to look at 3ds Max. So this is the modeling program that is sort of the industry standard. There's also Maya, which is now made by the same company. But essentially, you're going to see something that looks like this. Uh, we're also going to be using a program called Wings, which is a free one. So this 3ds Max costs money. Wings does not. I started off learning in Wings. It's a pretty good program. It doesn't have quite the same options, but uh, yeah. So first, uh, well, first I'm just going to go open up an Alamo viewer file, and then we can, me and Slever will walk through what the different aspects of the meshes are. So let's look at the ISD. Sound good? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, here we go. I'm gonna set up the scene for that. Oh, object viewer. Okay. So this is basically what a mesh looks like, or a rigged model looks like for Empire at War. Uh, so basically any mesh is going to be made up of little individual faces and lines and all that fun stuff. So we're going to show the wireframe here. This is what all the different lines look like on our Star Destroyer. Uh, and you'll see there's different objects in here, so I'm going to turn that off. You have all the blast points, they're their own objects. They're just little... Uh, if you look at that, can I just show everything but that? No. They're just little planes that have images put on them. But... Essentially in Empire at War, you're talking about... There's... Each one of these faces is essentially rendered separately by the game. Uh, that's how the game knows a way to interact light with it, interact... Or what to draw the texture on. Uh, basically, anything that the game needs to do with it, there's different shaders that make the model look how it does. Uh, so in Empire at War, you're usually talking about models that are 1,000 to 10,000 faces. So you're sort of working within that limit. But if you've seen any of Fractal Sponge's models, uh, that's in like 11 million polys. So uh, Slever, if you want to talk a bit about how that can impact performance and why optimization sure. is important yeah so uh generally what what we as developers will look at uh is general hardware specs uh things like how fast can uh a a system an average system run a certain amount of polys or a certain amount of draw calls uh a draw call is essentially a model getting drawn onto your screen um and we basically just kind of get an idea of how many draw calls we can send, how many polygons per draw call we can send, things like that. We kind of simplify it when we're doing it for Thrawn's Revenge. We just kind of uh, self-impose some limits about uh, how many polygons we can actually give for each model. So while we don't have as much detail in the in the model itself, which means like we can't really put greebles on there, things like that, we're actually doing it with the texture instead. Right. Um, it's textures are a lot easier for your uh, GPU and CPU to understand and read and draw than uh, than a mesh is. Right. Uh, so. so I guess I'll open up the precursor because I know I have the model file for that here. And you can sort of see this is what our precursor looks like with the model and skin and all the texture. So all the little details and stuff that are in there. 
But a lot of this isn't just the model. Uh, so if I open up wings here, if it'll let me open up wings here, that's why. Uh, thank you, OBS, for sucking. I really don't know how I feel about this new OBS thing. It seems to have a lot of issues. OBS Studio? Yeah. Mm hmm. A little bit of a learning curve to it. It was working. Oh my god. I set this up beforehand and it was working just fine. Yeah. Oh, well, that's dumb. Did I just do a monitor capture? Play capture. I'm going to have to just go back to. It'll work on. Yeah, that's dumb. It works on the second monitor, but not the first one. Anyways, so I'll move that over there. And this is sort of what that model looks like when it's just the mesh and with the UV. And usually when I'm UVing, I'll only do half of it because you want to save the texture space. So all that texture information gets put on the model essentially like this. You have, if I select this and window, UV editor window. So this is how combine it. This is how the texture knows where to put everything. So each of these faces gets sort of flattened in what is possibly the most tedious and annoying process known to man that Sleverd still somehow enjoys it. Uh, and That's a relaxing experience. You're essentially drawing on all the details of the ship in this space there. Yeah, to kind of abstract it, if you think about like like a bear skin rug, uh, you have to cut the, the bear in a specific way so that it lays out flat. We have to do the same thing for, uh, for our models. Uh, we have to cut it in specific spots so that when you're actually creating a texture for it, it doesn't look like it's stretched or contorted in any way. Right, so if I go back to OBS and it lets me load something up. Okay. So that's what it looks like with all the textures put on. So there's actually different types of textures that you'll have. You'll have the light textures, which are separate, uh, and they all render separately or render in different ways. So it's going to be doing something different uh, with the light texture, with the normal texture. Uh, the normal texture sort of, show, sort of shows the height. So everything that sort of looks like it's adding detail to the model, but isn't modeled on. So like these little notches here, those are all done through a flat texture, but with some slightly different information in it. So maybe I can open up the Photoshop stuff. I'll actually open up the Sins of a Solar Empire version of it because the textures are a little bit different in that, all the different uh, information maps. And uh, the way that those are read are by uh, what's called a shader. Uh, so it's basically taking uh, black and white values and converting it to uh, to either light information, to color information, uh, to specular information, uh, things like that in the engine. Uh, a lot of different engines may use different colors for different definitions. So uh, in SINs, for example, they may use blue for uh, <laughs> they they may use blue for something like a reflective uh, type of texture. So or saying like if it's closer to white it's more reflective if it's closer to black it's less reflective right uh, so i'll actually that. open up that map here uh, i'm just gonna add another display window because obs please please just work please work please work photoshop photoshop working sort of it's not showing the actual window oh my god it's showing photoshop but it's not showing the texture 
Hold on. I think I'm just going to switch to monitor capture on the other OBS. So uh, we will actually be right back. I'll see if I can leave this open long enough that it doesn't shut off the stream, actually. Gotta love that sound. I already have monitor capture set up for KOTOR. So. There we go. That should be better. Clever, if you want to just talk to make sure everything's being picked up. Sure. Okay. So that should be better for everyone. Uh, we're actually seeing what we need to see now. The monitor capture works. All right, so I'm just going to ask them, how, how difficult is it to make a model like, say, the Assert or Class SSD? Okay, so the bigger the ship, the more polygons you're going to be putting into it, and the more you have to sort of match everything. Uh, so that obviously takes longer to make. Uh, it all depends on the sort of detail level you're going for. But for our SSDs, we're usually going... As far as actual work goes, depends on who's doing it. 50 hours, I'd say, is fair. Yeah, somewhere on there. For just the, for just the model. So, uh, what would you like to spend on this? A lot. How hard is it to add a small paint job to a capture? So that all depends on what you're sort of trying to do with the... This is the, the basic texture information. So this is all the coloring you're going to see on the... It's called the diffuse map here. Uh, this is the Sins version. So in both Sins and Empire at War, if you have the or the color map open, if you go to the channels and you add a channel, so this is where the, it did tell the game uh, about team coloring. So if I have anything in black, it's not going to put your team color there. If I just draw in this white squiggle here, everywhere this white squiggle is, that's where it's going to put all your team color. So that's basically how team color works. If you make it a uh, lighter shade of gray, then it'll sort of show the team color there, but you can mostly see the coloring underneath it. Uh, so it's basically a transparency thing. But any in Sins, you have three main texture maps you're working with. Uh, you have the normal map. You have the color map we already looked at. The normal map, which is all the height I talked about. So you can see the lines here. It sort of gives it... The more contrast you have in the lines the higher the texture looks in that area. So if you skip through the to the alpha to the normal stuff, you can see it sort of lines going in different directions. And that sort of helps the light give some sort of contrast to it. And in the data map for sins, you have this is your specular map, which is sort of how the I guess how shiny is the easiest way to put it. Uh, The all the light stuff is in your green and alpha channel. Yep, so this is kind of the example of what I was talking about, right? So uh, the sin shader is looking at the green value and saying, okay, uh, I'm going to add an emissive value, which is basically saying, like, I'm not going to take in light from the outside. I'm just going to basically self-illuminate the object. Um, if you think about like really old 3D games, this is like uh, actually. Let's see if uh, I can think of an example off the top of my head. So, uh, say like with the flashlight from like uh, Uncharted or something like that. The the actual lens of the flashlight will have a similar type of look to that. Uh, it's self illuminated. It, it doesn't take in light from the outside. It basically uses the texture color to uh, illuminate itself. All right. So this is the ISD. Uh, yeah. So basically when you're making a texture, you're just drawing in all this stuff. It's There are some programs now where you can, it'll show you the actual model and you can sort of paint on it. Uh, but I don't think my computer can handle running that and streaming at the same time. So you'll just have to take my word for it. It's called Substance Painter, if you want to look that up. But uh, you would probably have a simple model in there. How much longer do you think you need to actually get good at this? Shots fired. Uh, is it harder to add textures for Sins or EAW? Well, there's a bit more to the texture maps than Sins, I'd say. But now that we've got the basics, I guess we should model something. So, I don't want to be here forever. I'd like to get the... Because we're just going to be doing this on stream. Maybe a fighter would be a good thing to do, just quickly. And uh, People have asked in the past to 
decent videos of modeling stuff. So if there's any larger models that I do, uh, we'd probably split that up between videos and not stream it. But uh, if anyone has any requests for a fighter to make quickly, by quickly I mean like an hour and a half. I mean, we could Rachel Ray this and kind of show some different parts of the process. So uh, yeah. uh, we can show some modeling and then... Uh, <laughs> we prepared <load> earlier. <laughs> yes. Load up another thing to kind of show what happens when you're... Uh, what do you do when you're UVing? Stuff like that. Or uh, what does it look like when we're starting out a texture? Something like that. Sure. That could work. What to... Make the Singularity Star Destroyer Black ID. You just have to change in Photoshop gray to black. Basically, if you uh, if you just add a black layer and other either do an overlay or a multiply layer, that should change the or a color layer that should change the color of it. Uh, you just want to make sure you don't actually wash out the details in it. So yeah, it's all about how you set up your layers in Photoshop. It's very similar to just having pieces of paper that are transparent on top of each other, right? Or having specific cutouts on top of it. If you layer out the color specifically on a specific part, you could make it look like that uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it's all about how you set it up initially. If you set it up on one layer and then try and do it all by making it black like that, it can take a lot longer than if you separate them out. You wing. So the reason, normally I'd be working in uh, 3ds Max here. Uh, there's a lot better tools, but since this is just sort of like an introductory modeling thing, I'm going to use the Wings 3D because it is free. So if any of you want to go out and just see if you enjoy 3D modeling, you can Google Wings 3D. I'm going to put it in the description after the stream when we put the VOD up. But uh, yeah, you can just play around in it. And I'm just going to try to use some basic commands here to show how that works. But let's see. You wing. Maybe Sith Interceptor. So you always need to get some reference images so you know what you're trying to model. The Alliance logo. It's actually kind of key with what we're building. If you're building from uh, something that's already had like design uh, Think about like style guides in that sense. So Imperials look a very specific way. Uh, Rebel ships look a very specific way. Uh, we need to be able to make sure that we're aligning all of our uh, all of our models to something like that, uh, especially if it's something that's already made. Uh, some of the ships we make aren't made uh, specifically with Empire of the Hand. Uh, we have to kind of come up with their their looks, uh, their styles, and things like that. So. Uh, we have to use reference from either text or uh, sometimes comics. Yeah, there's a lot of Star Wars stuff is completely inconsistent. So you're really just trying to find what's the best way to take it without messing everything up. A lot of it has to do with the length of time that Star Wars has been out. If you think about the style of, of art that's changed between the late 70s to now, it's quite different and the mediums that it's in as well. So different things like book covers to uh, to comics, to film, to some of the CG stuff from stuff like Star Wars Clone Wars and Rebels, things like that. So this is a basic low-poly TIE Interceptor. Uh, this is the one we use in Ascendancy, and I believe we've also ported it back to uh, Empire at War for 2.2. But really, you're just looking for the basic shape of everything, especially in low-poly, and you, want to do, you do want to leave a lot to the texture. So in the wings, you could inset it a bit, but that's adding polys for something that uh, a normal map would actually do for you to get the little insets around the edge of the wings. But, all right, you wing, tie punisher, the tie punisher. Is that one of the new ones? I can, all, I can never remember. Oh, it's the bunch of little extra things. So with stuff like the miniature games, it's actually really helpful. I got Bane to send me a bunch of pictures of the uh, punishing one 
from his armada thing like he just took a bunch of pictures from a different a bunch of different perspectives because having all the reference images from one thing so helpful you don't get any conflicting stuff you're not trying to match the proportions on something and then you look at another picture and then you have to change it because it's the only underside picture and you need to match that but yeah uh what are we Well, the sphere is going to be where all your detail is. You're usually giving yourself uh, a limit for that type of ship and then deciding which parts of it would best benefit from that. So on something like the TIE Interceptor, we had, I believe, 750 was the limit we set uh, for most fighters in Ascendancy. So for the most part, that's always going to go into the uh, into the cockpit and the TIE because... You want it to look actually round and that's why doing rounded stuff tends to be a lot higher poly or a lot more difficult because you're putting a lot of the uh a lot of the polys into just getting the basic shape yeah so uh just to kind of talk about uh poly count a little bit more uh the amount of copies of a mesh that's going to happen in gameplay actually accounts for how much we think the the poly count should be as well uh, scale is another factor. So it, in a game like Sins, you could have like 200 of these guys flying around. Uh, we don't want to have 20,000 poly times two, 200 times all those draw calls times all the effects that are happening with them. Uh, it can really slow down your frame rate. Uh, so when we build stations and things like that, they may have a higher poly count, somewhere around 10k uh, in in triangles, uh, but something like a, a capital ship may only have like one, it's somewhere between one and three thousand uh, tries. So uh, yeah, it's it's really dependent on how many how many copies uh, are actually drawn, uh, how many copies we think they're going to be drawn. Do that thing. So, for the Sith Interceptor, I think I'll probably start with the cockpit. This is going to be quick, so probably not going to be that good. I really wish, thought there'd be more different views of this. I never really liked the U-Wing, so I don't really want to make a model of it. This looks weird to me. Like the whole flat plane thing. I'm not sure. Did I, They must have explained somewhere why those exist. But the thing sticking out the front is just... So I'm going to start by getting the little peak of the nose there. Uh, wider than it is. I set this up differently. Did it out of fire? There we go. Now I can still see chat. I think it look, leans forward a bit.
It actually looks like it does this weird thing where this gets wider. And you never want to have a face that sort of looks like this. So three-sided stuff is okay, four-sided stuff is okay. Most games will automatically take any four-sided shapes and triangulate them. So it'll uh, basically do that. And you're never sure, unless you make this, the lines manually yourself, you're never sure what's, what it's going to connect or how it's going to smooth it. Because uh, the way you make the model isn't necessarily 100% how the game's going to render it. Uh, there's different things called smoothing groups, which sort of tells this whether it's supposed to be a hard edge or a soft edge. So that'd look different on a pillow versus a piece of metal, for example. But if you are... We had an issue with the Belter actually where a lot of the bases were quads, so they had uh, four edges. And the game, when I was exporting the mesh, would triangulate it all and it would mess up the smoothing and the normals, which is the way the faces render. So the direction that everything sort of points, which side of the face is the outward facing one. So half the mesh was invisible because uh, the faces were essentially set to be see-through. And that's something that you usually want to control directly rather than letting the program decide which is the best way to do it. Yep, different engines do that differently. Uh, so depending on how the triangles are formed from a quad, it might be in reverse order. Uh, Unity and UE4 actually do them differently. Uh, things like that. You So bringing in a quad might be not a, a smart thing to do. Uh, it could really break up, uh, break how your model looks. Yeah, so we had that issue in uh, in Sins, but we didn't have that issue in Empire at War, just because the way they export the models isn't actually the same. I think the way that ends up looking. Don't need these two, so we can delete them. Bring this back. Scale that down entirely. This is now too. But that's basically what it is. It's a several hours of moving around faces, trying to match random varying stuff. Look at... Top assets. There we go. So this is what the Belter mesh looks like without the skin, without any of the extra details. And you'll notice on the edges, uh, they're sort of beveled a bit, and that's basically to help with the smoothing I was talking about. So when you're smoothing the edges, it, if it has something, if it has extra faces to stop it, like otherwise these would look a lot more round. Uh, or you'd end up with some weird artifacts. You never really want to have uh, weird pointy stuff or any overlapping edges. I'll see if I can break the mesh. Just uh, delete some edges, create an end gone. Well, one of the first issues you can run into is this, where you have polygons going through each other in ways that they should not be. Uh, and yeah, an end gone. Yep. Uh, so what end gone stands for is, uh, it's a, basically N as number and gone as, uh, the, the face, right? So it can have a number of extra, or sides, uh, so it can have a number of extra sides over four. Uh, engines really do not like that. Uh, some of the older ones would just straight up not render the model, uh, or crash. Uh, they're a little bit more lenient on it now. They'll try to uh, triangulate the mesh, uh, even if you do have n-gons now. But uh, it will triangulate it more than likely 
uh, not how you want it to. Yeah, so you can end up with faces like this. The biggest issue that you'll end up with is uh, these sort of weird orientations that happen. So this face here now, it's technically all still one face, but it's all facing different directions, so it's not really clear to the engine or clear to the program whether it's supposed to be up like this, whether it's going inside there at all. So you typically would want to avoid that. And just something simple like adding in that extra line, it tells it that this is facing up that way, this is facing up this way. I'm going to see if Wings can display the normals. You... Do you know if it has a back face calling? So it won't show the back face, it'll just... Yeah. Uh... Right. Is something older? I'm going to try to look for a character model if I have any exported. Yeah, we have the Duros. So the way you do a character model would be kind of, this is kind of old, but it's the only one I have. Uh, this is our Duro civilian. But essentially when you're doing infantry models that are going to get animated, anything with animation, you have to sort of think about the way the mesh is going to move. So you could technically get away with, if you were just going to do something that's going to stay in this sort of T-pose, uh, get away with having the arm straighter out. But if anything's going to move at any given point, you sort of want to give the mesh uh, an area to move that isn't going to mess with it uh, so that you can take into account when you're doing the texture and the animation. Because basically when you're animating, you're creating a skeleton for it, and then you're telling each one of these vertices, one of the points, to move with a given bone. So if I have a bone over here and I tell that bone to move forward, I'm going to tell the model how much of the model should move with that bone, and you might have a uh, part of the model that's like 50% moving with this bone and 50% moving with this bone. Or you'll have an extra bone over here. Uh, but that's, if I were to actually be animating it, Wings doesn't do animation, so I can't really demonstrate that in here. But uh, you'd essentially want to have this extra elbow point here so that when it if you were to rotate all that forward, this isn't going to be perfect because it's not actually animating anything, but yeah. But in that in that same essence, it's basically you're you're adding geometry uh, to kind of blend uh, the bends of your of basically your your joints. Yeah. So uh, if it was just this, uh, if it was just the one piece there, this arm would have been completely bent. It's completely bent now. Not the. That's just wings doing wings things. Or because I'm editing the mesh, actually animating it, but you'd have instead of that bending, you'd have uh, sort of the arm folding in on itself, and this way it still keeps some shape to it. That was way more difficult than it should have been. Yeah. I can. So the program you actually use to rig for Empire War is this one. It's 3ds Max, but it's a really old copy, which is very difficult to get now and likes to freeze, which is always fun. For an animation example, do you still have the, uh, the, the AT... The ATTE that I was uh, doing a while back probably showed that one too. Uh, I do somewhere, but it's located deep in the bowels of your of your uh, hard drive. Yeah, with that one, it's a bit harder to show off what we're talking about here because the yes, it is the joints like it's mechanical, 
so it has different parts that are attached. Whereas with infantry, if I can just import a model, you can yes more easily so, see the arm bending. So what he's talking about is uh, because an ATT is all metal, uh, you're not going to have bending in it, uh, similar to cloth or skin. So the when he was talking about paint weighting of like saying it only do about fifty percent of this uh, bone and about fifty percent of this bone. Uh, hard surface will generally just have one bone does a hundred percent weight of this specific geometry. Uh, it's a little bit faster uh, to get done than having to uh, weight paint uh, organic models. If I can just open the aloe viewer. Source. Get silly. Yeah, that is the Duro. All right, this is what Sillery looks like in her T pose, just getting impaled by her lightsaber. You can sort of see all the different joints there. <laughs> In the middle of that, you can sort of see how the uh, those different parts of the model that are sort of added in as overflow, I guess, bend instead of forcing her shoulder in on itself. Got some spastic animations. I'm probably gonna find someone that's less crazy. Tiber. Here we go. There's some arm bending action. Yeah, so it still folds in on itself, but because it's not one direct line or even two direct lines, it's not sort of crunching up the rest of his arm. It's just this one little section in here that's changing. So that's the sort of thing that it's not really the model itself that you're worrying about. It's just the it's the rest of the process that you're thinking about. So you want to do that well for your UV as well. You don't want to make uh, it a complete mess for whoever's going to UV map your your model. Which is basically a game of Tetris. Uh, for UV mapping, basically take the model, and then you're going to tell it which edges you want to cut. So where you want it to fold out. basically want to keep everything connected on this square except for one mark edges for cut so yeah different uh, 3d applications have a lot of different processes for all of these different aspects so rigging is vastly different in Maya than 3ds max modeling is different in wings 3ds max and Maya uh, UVing is also quite different uh, but the, the end result is more or less the same. Right. And you want to keep everything in your UVs proportionally the same uh, as much as possible. You're always going to have to make some adjustments, but in order for the texture to stay consistent, it's best to make sure you are maximiz maximizing your space as much as you can and uh, you're not having like this part be this size and this part 
like that when you want them to look the same. So yeah, uh, the the technical term for that is texel density. So it's basically a you're identifying a pixel size per world space. Uh, so world space is like what how how big is a a foot a meter in in your uh, in game, right? So the you want everything to have basically uniform texel density, uh, a uniform. Uh, size of a pixel so that uh, you don't get really high definition textures on one spot and really low definition textures on another spot of the same exact model. There's one other thing I was going to do with that. Oh, right. So the other thing you want to do. So a lot of games, you're not actually going to be getting the shadows entirely generated in the game. Uh, so for a lot of models, you'll end up taking the taking the model and essentially rendering it onto its texture so you'll have the skin see if i can find the calamiter psd are you talking about ambient occlusion or are you talking about light ambient occlusion okay I know I have it somewhere. So yeah, I can kind of talk about ambient occlusion while you're looking for that. So uh, what ambient occlusion is, is basically uh, it's a way to kind of cheat uh, close objects, close objects in proximity, creating a, uh, a self shadow on itself, uh, on itself basically. So if you kind of like hold your fingers together how there's a black crease between each of your fingers. That's basically what it's generating. Uh, so yeah, we're, what we a lot of engines can't really do that. Uh, not as a uh, as a way from uh, creating like a shadows in that same in that same type of format, right? So uh, for sins, they generally just have one uh, directional light. It won't create ambient occlusion uh, from that. A lot of other engines have screen space versions of ambient occlusion. So it's basically just uh, once everything's drawn, it basically looks at all uh, the different uh, angles of meshes and sees what thing is close together, and then they'll make it a little bit darker there. Yeah. Uh, so we bake it directly into the texture. It makes it a little bit faster. Like, SINs won't even do that type of thing, right, in the engine. Uh, textures on when you actually bake it into the texture, it makes it render faster than having it done in screen space. Right. So if uh, we have the Allo Viewer version here open, what the in-engine shadow engines are essentially going to be doing is they're going to do sort of your major stuff. So if we look here, there, it's a completely different mesh that's basically projecting on itself. So this is what the Eclamor looks like without the shadow mesh, but you can still see there's sort of the some of the smaller uh, variants in texture. So like this part's darker when it should be in shadow, even though the chip is technically not casting any shadows. Uh, and that's all doing as Clever saying, or that's all coming in through the through the texture. So this is your live shadows, but then all the extra little details, all these little bits that are probably going to be in shadow no matter what. You got sort of some variance there. And that's all done here. So we have... And, uh, this is essentially this is what the acclimator texture looks like without any of that. But then once you add that in, you can see it adds just a bit more of the subtlety to it. This last layer adds a lot more of it, but you can sort of see where it's going to probably project on itself at any given time. And you're rendering that out separately. Just to save the engine some struggle, that's a huge performance saver because shadows are some of the most resource intensive things to do for an engine because you're essentially rendering everything once and then you have to do a second pass on it to see if the light should still be there or should still be intense. Anything that has transparency, you're essentially making the game do it twice. So, and the rendering model, it also greatly depends on that. So SINs does uh, forward rendering, not deferred. Uh, what that basically means is it has to go through each individual object and do all of the passes. Uh, so if there's a new light that's uh, 
added to the scene, it would have to redo everything over again. So it's basically exponentially in increasing the amount of time it takes to actually render a frame, every light that you add. Same thing with shadows. Right, but I think that covers most of the basics for rolling and skinning stuff. Anyone have any questions? I kind of want to do individual videos of just actually doing this stuff, but for the most part, they'd all be. I'd probably be doing them at like two times speed for the actual video because these processes do take a while and they're very tedious and you're it's a lot of just playing with stuff that's already there to get it to the right place uh so i do want to show i'll probably do a tutorial video on how to rig for sins or how to rig for empire at war at some point and that'll be at the proper speed because that's a bit easier or a bit quicker but as far as modeling and skinning goes you're sitting there for several hours playing. I actually did release a video when I was designing the Syndic. It's super old, so it's not great. But uh, I did a time lapse, and you can see my computer clock changing in the background. A mini game where we show the texture and have to guess. I guess I could show off some, show some of the texture maps. Yeah, just don't look at the top left of the screen because you can actually see that we, we kind of name our stuff actually all right. Code user but, doesn't. Some, yeah, code user doesn't. Yeah, but uh, everything yeah, we do have Blarga, Blarga, Blarga. That like literally just calls stuff Blarga, Blarga. And it's, I, I don't know what that is. Half of his stuff has gone missing just because no one, no one knows what it's called and can find it anymore. Or if you think you're done with something, you call it final, and then somebody says, oh, you need to fix it, so then you resave it as final final. Uh, da -da, da -da, da -da. We could kind of talk about uh, the design process, too, so or the design and review process. So for some of the uh, other uh, ships that we build, specifically with Empire of the Hand or some of the stations we build, right? Uh, we might start off with uh, just a really quick 2D sketch. Uh, I'll upload, like if I do a 2D sketch, I'll upload it uh, to our uh, development chat. Everybody looks at it, shoots, uh, basically shoots as many holes as they can through it uh, design-wise. And then I rebuild it again to make it better. Uh, then we keep going through that review process until everybody's okay with it. Uh, once that's done, uh, the person that's uh, tasked with modeling it, uh, so if I go and model that, I'll work through it just like uh, what Corey was showing earlier, uh, finish out the model, or possibly show some uh, in-progress pics to see how far I'm, I'm along or if there's anything glaring that I'm missing. Um, once I'm done with that, the model's done, we'll I'll do a UV pass. So this is actually one of the stations uh, that Corey's showing right now. I'm gonna just and, Google uh, the name of it and see if what comes up. I'm lazy. Yeah, it's probably it's somewhere up there. If not, it's definitely in the uh, ModDB page. Oh my God. I try to Google Oga Odo Station. It brings up OTO Stationary Bike. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so once. Once the UV is done, you ger generally don't need a review process for that, uh, just because either I'm texturing it, if like I'm modeling it and texturing it, nobody needs to review the UVs. Uh, then I, I go through the texture process, do the same exact thing. I uh, send up in progress picks, people shoot down what I'm doing wrong, and I fix it. And then I keep building it until it's done. Uh, and then once that's done, I send it over to uh, either Corey or uh, or code, or I, I, generally it's Corey, uh, that'll do the rig for the for that specific uh, object and bring it into SINs and uh, into uh, EAW. Yeah, so a lot of the... A lot of the changes we make tend to be... Or recently, a lot of what we're doing is redoing some of the older, worse stuff. 
but even part of just that it's not always adding polygons to it it's a lot of our stuff was higher poly than it needed to be for what it was going out so we'd be getting uh 6,000 poly models for something when we could get the exact same look but bring it down to like two or three thousand uh, and that's a lot of what Slever does uh, uh, with the and one of the things we're doing in the future we're going to be essentially completely revisiting a lot of the Empire of the Hand space and ground units to bring them into a more uh, similar design pattern because there are a lot that are completely different from the rest of the faction. There's still supposed to be like some different influences in there because they're not all coming from the same manufacturer like all Star Destroyers do or whatever. But there's a lot of variants that we're not supposed to have. Uh, I mean, like, when did we start modeling Empire of the Handships? 2006. So was, yeah, so uh, our skills have updated since then, I hope. <laughs> We've yeah. gotten better at modeling and better at texturing and things like that. So if you're uh, ever yeah. trying to start a total conversion mod or trying to do any sort of large-scale project like that, uh, try to set out at the beginning what the basic properties of any given faction are going to be. And you can even uh, start uh, blocking out just basic assets you can share between different models. So if you're doing a type of turbo or a type of weapon for a faction you don't necessarily need to remodel that turret every single time on a different ship because there should realistically be some similarities between that so once you have the turret the turret modeled for one thing you can even do it on its own you can then sort of swap that between models make a few modifications as you need to and that's a great way to save time and keep some similar designs or similar influences between everything yeah, we do that for textures as well. So uh, some of the main whole uh, textures will have uh, a like one that's out in a database that we grab from. Uh, it makes texturing the at least the start of it really fast. And also because we have like four or five people doing textures, you can end up with. Uh, you need to make sure that our styles are as similar as possible. Like me and code user, I learned a lot of my text from just doing a worse version of what code does so our stuff tends to be a similar style but uh if you're sharing some of those assets between them uh you end up with a much more cohesive look which is kind of the problem with uh just like grabbing models from a bunch of different places they end up looking really inconsistent not just in the quality but in the actual style what was i looking for I've been looking for... Oh, now I remember. So. Here's the Providence. Probably not wings? That sounds promising. <laughs> it is promising, but I opened like six windows. Alright, so this is actually one of the oldest models in the mod. Uh, it's our Providence model. It's actually still really good. It's just super high poly. So you can get away with... Uh, or you'd ideally want to use fewer polys in the engines, especially. Uh, with round objects, it's still, again, kind of hard. But you can... We have... Out there. So out of the total 5,300 faces, which isn't too, too bad... The engines alone make up almost a thousand of that. So this small part of the ship, oh, plus these two. So yeah, over a thousand polys just in those. So that's the kind of thing where even if you reduce this to being like 8 to 10 sided instead of like 22 sided, you're cutting down the, uh, you're cutting down the poly count in the model by a ton, and you're also depending on how you do set up the smoothing, you're not actually going to lose any of the visual fidelity there. But I think that covers everything I wanted to talk about. Anything else you want to bring up, Slubber? Uh, no. Uh, you could probably answer some questions if there are any. Yeah, if anyone has any questions now, that's about it. It's going to be a bit, obviously, a bit shorter of a stream today than we'd usually do when playing a game. 
But I just wanted to sort of talk about some of the things to think about if you want to get into modeling, show off some of the programs you can use, uh, and maybe just a basic idea of what's going to, of how to do that stuff. Uh, again, I'll probably try to do some videos of actually modeling, but again, because it's it takes so long to do anything properly, I don't want to just keep everyone here and watch me tweak some vertices for hours. Is the angle relative to the weapon joint? Okay, so for firing angles in Empire at War, the way the guns are directed, find something. Armadia? Sure, why not? This is another really old. But it's calculating the angle off from that. Oops. Uh, it's the red point here, so it's calculating the angle relative to this. So uh, I believe when you're doing a turret, it will. The, it's the entire turret model that's moving. So this will still be pointing in the same direction relative to the model. If I can find. The RAF turret. So no matter which way you set the turret to be at rest, that's going to be influencing where this model itself is pointing. It's going to rotate the model like that, but this bone is always still going to be pointing there. So it's always going to be relative to the firing position. That makes sense. Why not add Colonel Sarah or X2 into the New Republic faction? Well, they weren't part of the New Republic, really. And like that, that whole game is messed up. We don't even want to touch... The storyline and the weird side battlefront stories. They're making people do stuff that when they were already doing stuff at other times. It, it, it's just a mess. Like, different faction. That whole X1's Empire thing. He was controlling planets that were already controlled by other planets. Like, the, the capital of Zindu's Empire was apparently his main base. And so was Mustafar. He got to Mustafar from that. It's, I don't... I don't <laughs> Will you make an asserter model at any point? We have no plans to make the asserter, but you never feel the result, so you feel like it's not changing the firing angles? All right, but yeah, that'll do it. So we're going to get back to regular games after this stream. Next weekend, we're going to be doing a community game. Uh, probably going to be playing Ascendancy, so if anyone wants to come participate in that, I'm going to put up the alerts in the Discord and also on Steam. Uh, I might try to pull in Scholar Bane or some of the team. Clevered. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, if I have time. Should be able to. But yeah, so thanks for watching this time. If there's anything specific you want to see a modeling video of, not the asserter, because that would take forever. Uh, that would be like a 15-part series. But yeah, so thanks for watching, everyone. We'll be back next weekend with the Ascendancy Community Game and throughout the week with actual gaming videos. So see you next time. See you guys.